attorney and then became president of the organization uh, in 1999 and have been there working ever since. And of course, my link now to Citizens for Global Solutions is as a board member of CGS, working uh, to link world citizenship and world federation together. Uh, and I'm also the team leader for the uh, Peace Studies Outreach Group and the Multimedia Media Group. So anyway, um, as Bob mentioned, the first part of the, after I tell a little anecdote and actually refer back to a few questions from last meeting, we'll have an open discussion and then we'll, uh, I'll turn it back to Bob to talk a little bit about um, symbolic actions. And then when we talk about symbolic actions, we'll move into how we can look at what Gary Davis uh, did uh, uh, and his amazing, you know, sort of uh, bold actions that he took in his life uh, and what we can take from those for the World uh, Federation Movement, World Citizenship Movement. Um, so first I'd like to start with um, an anecdote and a few pictures. Um, Eastern and Hindu philosophy had a big impact on Gary. And you'll, if, you know, if you've read the book, part of the book or, or all of the book, uh, you know uh, his ideas of uh, hol holism and unity. Uh, and of course, Gary having um, given up his US citizenship and he already knew that the world was one, uh, but he wanted to really learn the philosophical underpinnings of viewing the world in a holistic way. So Gary actually had two, Gary was my guru, I would say. He was my wisdom giver or my spiritual guide uh, in this process of learning about what, what does it really mean to be a human? What does it mean to be a world citizen? Um, but he had two gurus. Um, Gary's gurus taught him to look at a problem, an issue or a concern as a consequence of the entire system in which that problem arises. If you take a holistic view of the world so that you can see all of the intricacies of the problem, the, the give and take, the, the polar opposites, his gurus explained, then you'll be able to transcend that problem and resolve it. So now I'm gonna share my screen if I can do this. Um, hold on a second. And I'd like to show you a picture of Gary uh, and I'll maybe make this larger. Oops, that's too big. So I'll scroll down as we go. But here's Gary, my, the little hand that's pointing here, that's Gary right here. And that's Gary right here. That's, this is Gary at the Gurukulam, uh, which is really the home of the gurus, uh, where they, they teach their uh, views or ideas on unitive science. And this was in Southern India. Um, both of Gary's gurus were experts in the philosophy of Advaita Vedanta, literally non-dualism, which is the premier and oldest schools of Indian philosophy. It involves a quest to understand uh, the source of everything, which uh, in this philosophy is called Brahman, um, as well as the self, which is uh, called the Atman, and the relationship between uh, everything or the source of everything and the self. And this holistic philosophy posits that the core of our own being um, is the self in all beings. Um, objects, animals, plants, people appear separate, and yet all are connected in fact, one at their source, which is the self and, and which is pure consciousness. So here's Gary again over here, uh, right here and there at the bottom right here. And now uh, I'd like to show you a picture of, of one of his, first one of his gurus, which is Harry Jacobson. And uh, Harry Jacobson uh, was actually the first uh, disciple of uh, Dr. Natarajan, who appears in the book a little bit later. And uh, he was uh, living in um, New Jersey and started his own curriculum in New Jersey, actually. Uh, and Gary worked with him in his machine shop uh, in New Jersey for several months in 1952. Um, Gary and Harry would have long talks about holistic thinking in the state of the world. Um, Gary was frustrated about the Korean War as it had just you know, started in the early 1950s. He was frustrated that his work to bring people together uh, was no match for the national war machine. So Gary asked Harry what he should do. And Harry said, Gary, you must continue to take action. If you see a problem in the world, you must take action to change it. If you change yourself, the world will follow. In other words, be the change that you want to see in the world. So. Harry Jacobson said, Gary, you must do, you must act. But Gary also had another guru and that's Dr. Natarajan, but who Gary always referred to as, um, as Nataraja guru. 
And this is a picture of Nataraja Guru. And as you read in the book, Gary made the trip to India to expand his learning of uh, holistic thinking. Uh, Gary needed a break, break from constantly being in the spotlight, but he did feel guilty for not continuing his actions toward world peace. Um, so Gary asked Nataraja Guru about the guilt that he felt, you know, what should he do? And Nataraja uh, said to Gary, don't worry, Gary, let go, put your mind at ease, relax, do nothing. The world and the universe will go on even if you're doing nothing. And this was really a big solace to Gary who needed a break from the constant barrage of the press and the years in the public eye. So uh, let me remove my screen, uh, shared screen here um, and, and let you know that, well, so Gary had two root gurus, one who told him to take action and one who told him to do nothing. <laughs> so, you know, the, the polar opposites of the, of the spectrum, right? And so I think that they told him what they knew he needed to hear at that moment in, in his life. So, of course, in the end, uh, his concern for the world and for humanity pulled him into a life of action and to continue his role as world citizen, number one. But I, I also think it's, for, for me, is telling this sort of anecdote is, is fun because it shows, it shows the holism in the, in the picture of, of how you understand your life and how yourself relates to others. And certainly the idea of, of unity that, that we find in World Federation and in world citizenship. So um, before we transition into the, an open discussion now of, of my country as the world uh, and talk about overall thoughts of the book, I would like to refer back to two comments that I didn't get to refer back to that were raised at our last meeting. I'm so delighted actually that the two people who raised those comments are actually here today. Uh, so the first comment was by Lee Davis. Um, and Lee had mentioned how she was surprised um, how Gary could remember all the details, especially of, of conversations that he had uh, from years before. Uh, so, you know, I thought about that and I remember Gary telling me, and, and also you see this in the book a little bit when you hear Gary talk about having his typewriter, having his briefcase and always being worried about if he's getting thrown out of a country, you know, will he get his typewriter back? Will he get his briefcase back? Because his typewriter, as you know, he was sitting in the, was it in the Egyptian embassy, I think, and he was typing a protest, uh, you know, a protest letter while he's sitting there in front of the officials. So having that, that tool for him would be like having, you know, your, your mobile phone uh, today, that tool to reach out to the, to the rest of the world. So he wasn't, you know, isolated as, as that, you know, playing the role of world citizen and sometimes being absconded, you know, into, into a, a prison type situation. So having his, his paperwork with him and of course his briefcase, because he did did keep a journal, a very detailed journal of events and things that went on during his life. And, and many times, I think over the years, because obviously his briefcase got too heavy, he would send papers back to his family in Maine, where they would hold on to the, that paperwork. Plus, of course, uh, there were thousands and thousands of articles uh, written about in interviews with Gary over the years. So both his personal diary or journal uh, and his uh, all the newspaper articles were enough to help him to recall or, or, um, uh, and retain you know, most of the important conversations that he had over the years. So you know, there was an important point that you, you mentioned, Lee, about, about how did he remember these things? So that, that, was, that was really how. And then Ron Glossop brought up the idea of Esperanto. Um, uh, and I think Ron may be the, 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 the biggest uh, um, pro proponent of Esperanto in the world, at least that I know, and which is a wonderful thing, um, because it is an important tool to bring people together, because we know how language can, can separate us. But, uh, and, and Ron did mention this, but I, I thought it would be important to reiterate, and that is Gary recognized the importance of, of Esperanto in the beginning of the world citizenship movement. Um, the first world password actually was in English and Esperanto. And all the WSA documents that we have created since then, which are, I don't know, about 10 or 12 different documents, so an ID card, a birth card, a birth certificate, a political asylum card, the world citizen card and certificate, all these are um, in Esperanto, as well as the six other official UN languages. So it's important to, to think about, even if Esperanto doesn't become the official world language at some point in the future, it's still important to think in, in those terms. So anyway, that, that's, that's all for me for, for right now. Um, what I'd like us to do now is open the meeting to questions, uh, thoughts, what struck you about the, the book, either, you know, the second half of the book, since we haven't really talked about the, that yet, or the book overall. So now I'd, I'd like to open the stack. So if you'd like to uh, say something, raise your hand, and then I will write your name down. Oh, so I've got Arthur. Uh, and then, we'll, of course, we'll go to people who haven't talked first after the first round of, of asking people who wants to talk. 
um, and we'll keep the conversation going. And then at some point, probably at about uh, uh, in about a half hour to 40 minutes, we'll try to wind down this part of this conversation and then we'll go to Bob to talk a little bit about taking symbolic action. So anyway, um, Arthur, anybody else? Ron, you, you're next in the stack. Anybody else for right now who wants to go get in the stack? Donna? Okay, Melanie? Okay, so I guess we'll start with that. And Arthur, you, would you like to start? Well, actually, I just wanted to ask you a couple of questions. First of all, I love that. I actually hadn't seen that picture of Harry Jacobson and a few of those others. So please do send us those. And if you have more. And also, I thought it was great to connect uh, as I reread the book and so on with the spiritual uh, roots of what, what, what Gary said. Um, and also, um, how much of those original diaries are, are still available? Have they been tracked down in Maine? Have they been put together? Uh, how much can we keep that, preserve that original material? So Bob and I have been talking about this in our multimedia group of CGS. Uh, it's something that has to desperately be done, not only for the World Citizenship Movement and Gary Davis's writings, uh, but also on World Federation, because there is a lot of historical, not just writings, but uh, footage, video, probably cassette you know, tapes and other things that need to be transcribed and digitized. And Bob and I have talked about how at the art, uh, at the University of Maryland, there's a, uh, uh, Bob will put you in the sack, there is a, uh, a, a project to, uh, to ar archive things. We might be able to find an intern or a student to help us to do that. It's something that, that we need funding for. So certainly it's a, it, it has to be done, but really we have to, we, we can't pay an intern to just sit there all day and transcribe or digitize, you know, eight hours a day. That would be, you know, you'd have to pay them to do that. So we have to find somebody to help us to do that. But I can tell you at WSA's office, which is also where CGS's uh, uh, national office is, uh, in b both in my direct office in a small fourth floor closet and in the basement of the church building, there are literally almost a hundred boxes of old letters and binders and information, not just from Gary, but from people from around the world who had written to Gary and news clippings and other things. So sadly, we don't have many pictures of Gary, which is, which is frustrating to me with regard to social media. Um, but more of it, we're very heavy on the, on the written or, or writing side of it. So there's a lot of that that has to be at some point transcribed. So we, we actually do have tons of pictures as you saw. So, in, in so let movie, me cut in to say, them. let me right. cut in to say we have 20 minutes for this right. first okay. part okay. of the conversation. Okay. Sorry. Thank you. Sorry. Thanks, Bob. Okay. Well, so Arthur, yes, we'll, we'll talk about this outside of the room. So Ron, you were yeah. next. I only want to make the comment that in reading the book, I am repeatedly astounded of how Gary was able to do things. And it seems to me that his training as an actor must have been playing a big role in his readiness to adapt to all kinds of amazing situations. Yeah, like his, uh, his uh, former wife says at the beginning of the film, if he didn't have a sense of comedy or a sense of humor, he, it, you know, it, would have, it would have ruined him, yeah. And he also did have, as you indicated, the keeping of records. He did have a sensitivity about how important what he was doing was not just during his own life, but how it was going to be important afterwards. Right, and, and one thing was certainly clear when he stole the panties at the, at the lingerie at the department store and had forgotten to put out the press release ahead of time uh, people just thought he was, you know, had gone crazy or something. And why, why was he stealing lingerie when the point was to put himself into the civil code or, you know, or the criminal code of the country so he could stay there. But, but it's, it is clear, you're right, Ron, that, that he did, that he did, took actions with import and tried to maintain the, the legacy of that by writing it down and sharing it. Um, so Donna, you were next. Um, I just have a few, a few sections I want to comment on and maybe some of them we'll come back to in the follow-up questions. Um, some of the things that really struck me, like on page 186, he says, I was reminded of the tremendous power of public opinion spearheaded by a persistent press. And I feel like that is a sentence that we world federalists need to, need to talk about and figure out how to, how to do that. I mean, how to, get the public opinion, you know, 
tap into the tremendous power of public opinion and 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 the press. Um, another another um, thing that struck me at, and that I guess just resonates something I have always been worried about is page 191. He talks about the ne- how national currencies fund wars. And I often think that that is a way for us to get to the power of public opinion, you know, about that our tax dollars are going to, you know, how much of them are going to the military to fund wars that are not keeping us safe anymore. Um, I worry a little that that is a topic that seems more appealing to the older generation than the younger. And somehow talking about war doesn't seem to go over very well um, with the yet the younger generation, but but maybe talking about the dollars would, I don't know. Also on page 203, he talks about how he observed the Pope and how it, it you know, it, it, um, it um, was, a, was an enlightening or, or heartwarming experience. And he saw the Pope as a great humanitarian and a one worlder in his own realm. And as uh, Dave Auten is planning a meeting for us, um, Citizens for Global Solution, coming up on December 9th, where we're going to be talking about our current pope, who also is a great humanitarian and a one-worlder in his own realm. And he has just issued a new encyclical, and we'll be talking about that encyclical, hopefully along with one of our CGS National Advisory Council members, the newest one, Bishop John Stowe, who is the Bishop President of Pox Christi USA. So I think tapping into into um, into that that realm, the, the Catholic world, could be helpful. And finally, I just want to say that I had to smile when I saw the place in New Jersey was Bloomfield, New Jersey, because I lived in Bloomfield, New Jersey, for the first ten years of my life, and I thought, whoa, gave me goosebumps. Okay, that's me. Thank you. (laughs) Thanks, Donna. Okay, Um, Melanie, you were next. Well, um, I love what you said, Donna, and thank you for all those comments. Um, I just am so surprised at myself that this was a page turner, even though I've read it before. Um, This is my favorite book of his. Of course, he has lots of other ones, and you can get those uh, from the World Service Authority or Amazon. the big thing is I love the fact that going through this book is giving people ideas on action because I think that is the key, you know, we need to mobilize people. And I hope I said this in our other podcast, but I'm hoping that this election and what's going on and what we're discovering ha- has been a wake up call so that we can't just stand by. So I'm hoping a lot more people will get involved and, and, our organizations and uh, things will get better. So I'm so happy this is happening. So that was all I had to say. Thanks. Yeah, well, so just a quick comment before we go to Bob is Donna and, and Melanie, I think I'm so delighted that we're work, starting to work with the Young World Federalist Group, which has hundreds of people already involved. And, and certainly I think we could go to them and ask them about how we could bring in the idea of national currency and war, maybe the idea of of religion and of course how to get to the press because I think they, they may have some interesting social media ideas on that and definitely you know they're they're already taking some action uh, which of course will be the second part of our conversation today uh, about you know putting ideas into action yeah thank you okay Bob sure oh, thank like you uh, yes to, so a, a, a comment and a question the comment was about archiving so just to give people a little background there are, there, there are a handful of uh, programs, master's degree programs in graduate schools around the country um, that focus on historic preservation and archiving. They have degrees in it. And it just so happens that one of the five best in the United States is near our office in Washington, DC, which makes sense because you know the National Archives are there and, and all that stuff. So naturally there would be a good program there. So we have been reaching out to them to try to establish us as an internship site. So they, you know, just as David said, he has closets full of boxes. We have a whole outdoor storage unit, you know, in one of those you store it places filled with cartons of stuff. So we're going to, you know, the COVID situation has hampered our, you know, getting to the Dean, getting it all set up. 
But our plan is as soon as is feasible is to try to secure ourselves as an internship site and both preserve the hard copy documents as well as build an extensive online archive, which we can then attach to our website. So anybody from a fifth grader doing a book report uh, onto you know, somebody retiring just wants to read all this stuff, will be able to go and see all these documents. So that is in our plans, just to let you know, we've already initiated the contact to the university. The second thing I have is a question to David. Um, all of Gary's, um, you know, his, his contacts with the gurus, his spiritual side, did that all come after he um, renounced his citizenship and all that? Or did he have any of that before? Uh, kind of what led him in that direction? If you could just speak more to that. Yeah, well, so his father was Jewish. His mother was, uh, was it, I know she was Christian, but I can't remember which, which part, you know, which of the part of the faith. Uh, Arthur or Melanie might remember. Presbyterian. That. What is it? I think Presbyterian. Presbyterian. So, um, so uh, Gary didn't have you know much direction in faith uh, as a young child, and from what Gary told me, he was because his parents were so you know where there was uh, his father was a, an orchestra leader, a big band leader, and always sort of on the road, and his mother sometimes was with him. That he was more raised by the the butler and the housekeeper who were sort of his friends. Uh, and you know, were the, the shoulder to cry on, or and of course his big brother Bud, than he was his parents. So he didn't have his faith was, did not a religion did not play, from what I know, a big part of his of his youth. And I really think it was the soul searching that he had to do uh, after you know dropping those bombs from the you know nineteen thousand feet in his plane and seeing the devastation that said you know. Uh, the remorse and the humiliation that he felt having done that, that really had to say, okay, you know, did I, I killed my fellow human, I've, I've killed part of myself. Uh, how do I, how do I uh, atone for that? And I think it was that search uh, after the war that really brought him to both to Harry Jacobson and to uh, uh, Nataraja Guru. So it was definitely, uh, you know, I don't even know if it was even initially at the beginning part of the world citizenship movement, but more, even more so after he sort of realized the, the kind of scary, almost uh, power and uh, ego that you could get when you have, you know, Gary Davis, Gary Davis, all these, you know, the French people yelling his name, you know, the 20,000 people uh, and, and where that could sweep you away to. So, uh, so certainly it, it was definitely uh, all of those experiences after the war that really brought him to, to the spiritual side, the, the unitive side. And, and I, I really think that the unitive side is so useful for, like I said, for World Federation and World Citizenship, because it is a, it is a question of, of bringing humanity together, not, on the, not just on the symbolic side, but on the, the legal and political side. Great, thank you. And let me just let, let everybody know we have about 10 more minutes for this part of the conversation. Thank you. And oh, so Bharat, I just wanna say one more thing, Bob, before I forget and Bharat, then you're next yeah. in the queue. And that is, uh, we, uh, we've been talking for many, many years to have a, a World Citizen or World Federation virtual museum. And so this really just piggybacks on your thought about how uh, if not only preserving the hard copy, but digitizing and putting it online in it really in a museum. Uh, because then you could be anywhere in your world, in the world, on your phone, on your laptop, or whatever, and learn about uh, the the history behind this, uh, which we you know so desperately need to share. But so yeah, we need we need a museum, a digital virtual museum. Okay, Barat, go ahead. You're you're muted. Uh, first of all, I'm sorry I'm late in joining, but I don't know if you know, but today it's a uh, big day in India. In fact, all over the world, it's uh, Diwali and Indian New Year all at the same time. It's been part of a final day of a five-day festival. So we had lots of WhatsApp calls, you know, between here and India. So that delayed me. Uh, yeah, the, you know, I read the book uh, before our first meeting so some of my memory is a little foggy, but the last uh, conversation or the question that Bob asked made me uh, think about something that uh, sort of intrigued me when I read the book. And that is that you almost have to be somewhat of a detective to figure out 
how and where Gary picked up different informations because in the writing of the book, he so readily kind of, I wish I had examples, but he readily sort of uh, quotes or, or brings out some insight of somebody else that uh, a profound, you know, insights, and and he does that of some of the uh, uh, the sort of Hindu writings and so on. And I didn't have any sense of you know how he came upon that. Was he a kind of a ferocious reader and student of all of these different philosophies and? so on, and is that what made it easy for him to connect with his guru and, and you know, on the ship and then go off to India and things like that? I mean, it's, it's a sort of a remarkable kind of thing because he doesn't look like someone, oh, I wanna go to the ashram and, you know, like many people did and became, you know, real students. Uh, anyway, that's, that's what, it was just an observation that I wanted to share and maybe David or if you have any insights into how we got into some of those things. Could it be from his entertainment? Because I know in entertainment, there are a lot of interesting, uh, since India was into cinema and, and, and uh, drama and so on for hundreds of years before. So they're legends and stories, and I don't know whether that came on the stage or whatever. Anyway, can you, sure. do you have any <laughs> insights about that? Well, so first I'll say Happy New Year. Happy Diwali. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, and yes, I mean, there was a combination of factors, I think, that brought Gary to uh, Advaita Vedanta or, you know, a unitive philosophy. I don't know, Broad, whether you were on the call right at the beginning, because I was talking a little bit about the uh, Hindu philosophy that, that Gary uh, became a proponent of and, and weaved into the idea of world citizenship. Um, but certainly, uh, he uh, was a voracious reader. You're right about that. That's a good intuition that you have. Uh, he, he read everything, um, poetry, uh, uh, philosophy, you know, uh, everything that he could get his hands on. And I would say part of that was due to the fact that he did, uh, he didn't ever finish college. He did partly go to acting school for a little while, but never finished college. So he really, his, his university was his reading was the, what was so interesting is the, that because of his being so famous, he met so many different people, uh, not just in his travels, but even where he was, whether it was in Paris or whether it was, you know, somewhere in Germany or Italy or wherever he found, you know, in Iran, in Afghanistan, he could, he always had deep philosophical discussions with, with people. I mean, even with me on my ride home, with, uh, you know, on my speakerphone in my car, <laughs> every night after work when he was still alive, we would have deep philosophical discussions. So he learned so the, the world and, and the rest of humanity was his school, was his schooling. But certainly how he got specifically into, uh, I would say, Indian or Hindu philosophy was really I, I would say, and because I, I didn't ever hear Gary explain this in any other way, it was really by the luck uh, of him having met Dr. Natarajan on that on that uh, ship uh, on the boat. Because uh, having met him and ha and Dr. Natarajan having said, "Oh well, you should meet with Harry Jacobson since you're on your way back to the United States," that you know I think his experience with Harry Jacobson really helped him to say, "Okay, now I I, I have to go to India to make this you know to to bring this uh, uh, more clear in my head." Bob? Yeah, I, I, I will say that there is, um, I mean, a, a, as we know in American culture in the 60s and definitely the 70s, there were waves of people going to India, Tibet, you know, uh, uh, Thailand, you know, and uh, Ram Das is probably the most well known, but Jack Kornfeld, who started uh, the Spirit Rock, I mean, many people went over and then came back and, and taught. Um, but I think what makes Gary unique is he went before the wave, you know, there, there, were, there were people and it, it does sound like it was a coincidental thing as so much of life is in terms of not that he was sick, he bumped into someone who then connected him with someone else and all. So it sounds like that's what you're saying. Yes. But what really makes his story unique in that sense is he was not part of a wave. He was before the wave, which is, you know, sounds like the story of his life. So I just wanted to underscore that. Thank you.
Yeah, he was a trailblazer, definitely. <laughs> okay, Lee, go ahead. Okay, you can hear me now? Yes. Uh, one thing that amazes me is that I was in grad school when, when he was bouncing around Europe and getting a lot of publicity, and I never, ever heard of him. Um, so that, I guess I was in a narrow world of my own or something. Um, <laughs> but in reading about his going from country to country to country and getting in and out of jail in Europe for over a long period of time, he was in his 30s, I think, while he was doing that. I found myself trying to understand why, why he wanted to get to Berlin and why he took all the effort to try to get there. I mean, it was just going from one country to another to another and having a terrible time trying to get to Berlin. And I never was quite sure what the goal was. Was he trying to show that with a world passport, you actually could move around the world um, to give a demonstration to show that world citizenship can be, can be carried through. And he was the example of how to do it. Or am I missing something? What, what did he want to do in Berlin if he got there, which he never did, I guess. No, he never did. Yeah. <laughs> Well, Berlin was a divided city or became a divided city, right? The East and West. Uh, and part of the main reason to really go to Germany and not necessarily specifically Berlin was, was the remorse and guilt that Gary felt having dropped the bombs on, on Pienemund uh, and, and seeing the devastation there. Uh, he, he wanted to read, well, you know, he had heard of, uh, about a young man named uh, Noel uh, who uh, had gone back to Germany um, to rebuild the churches that, that he had destroyed in the war. So Gary heard of that story, that and the, the book Anatomy of Peace said, okay, where could I go? Where's the flashpoint or the focus in the world now? And, you know, the East and West division, you know, maybe now it's more North, South than East, West. But that, at that point, it was the, you know, the, the height of, or the beginning of the Cold War. And uh, I think Berlin was really that, that city that represented the, the, once again, the division that he wanted to bring together. So Berlin was really that, that's the reason why Berlin specifically, but Germany in general, because of, because of that was where, you know, he had dropped the bomb specifically. And certainly using the world passport, I have to say for Gary was really uh, a, out of necessity. I mean, he had no documents. He had no government other than the one that the world citizen government that he, that he found to represent him or to support him or to back him up legally. So he, he had to use that if he was going to travel in any way, because he wasn't a refugee. A refugee, you can get a refugee travel document from a government. But no, he was simply stateless, like the you know 10 million or more people who are stateless in the world who cannot get a document simply because there's no uh, government that will give them one or they don't want to give them one. So he needed it out of necessity. And, and many times Gary will say, World password is really just a first step to the implementation of a world where, uh, you know, in a perfect world, you wouldn't need a passport. You would, it would be one world. We, yes, we might have different states within that world, but it would just be like going from Illinois to Missouri, you know, New York to New Jersey. You don't need a, at least yet, <laughs> need a password to go from one state to the other. And that's really his vision for the world. So using the world password was one way, one tool to, sh to show that. Can I, can I jump in with so a before, before you, hold on, before you jump in, let me just let David know we are at the okay. transition point, but okay. there are a few more hands. Okay, so, so I guess take, I'd if, like to take people if, who haven't if, talked. Yes, talk. if you would take one more cue, and okay. if I could ask everybody to be brief. So, so we can make our transition. So Thank who, you. And you'll still have some chance to talk in the second part here. So yeah, of I saw Tom hasn't talked yet. And I saw Donna, then Arthur, and then Bar Barat. So we'll do that, but keep, try to keep your comments to about a minute if you can. Okay, so Tom, go ahead. Quick question about archiving. I have a recollection that CGS has put a lot of archival material in Indiana University or somewhere in, in, in and we ought to not lose track of where that is. And I don't have the exact reference. Okay, yeah, thank you. Yeah, so sir, Bob has that information, Tom. Bob okay. does? Okay. Yeah, Bob does, yeah. Good. Uh, Donna? Thank you. You're welcome. I was just gonna, I was just gonna um, read a sentence from page 175 that Berlin, um, no other city in the world so clearly exemplified the evils of nationalism nor seemed so obvious a place to plant the staff of world government. 
truly, if any people of any city in the world were ready for the first world citizen, the people of Berlin were. So I just thought I'd share that quote. Yeah, that, that's perfect. Yeah. Thank you, Donna. What page was that on? 175, 175. page 175. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, uh, Arthur? Oh, well, yeah, and, and it was it was Brandenburg, uh, not the, Pina, Pina Munda was get, the war factory, he was glad to bomb, but it was Brandenburg where he saw himself killing humans like his brother and the agony that he went through with his brother's death and his determination to go and uh, rebuild the, the cities that he had bombed that initially sent him on that, on that mission. Uh, and uh, uh, I think it's it, you know, good point that he didn't make that as clear in, in the book, maybe as he should have. But, uh, yeah, just uh, just quick go ahead. Okay, go ahead. Okay, good. Yeah, thank you for correcting me on that. I appreciate it. Okay. Oh, by the way, Brandenburg is very close to Berlin. The Brandenburg Gate is in Berlin, and uh, it's kind of part of almost the same <clears throat> large area. So it's a uh, it's a part of his motivation. Yeah, that makes sense. That more sense, definitely. Okay, Barat. I, I just want to make an observation that uh, Vedanta, the philosophy that attracted uh, uh, Gary to go to India, the root of it resides in the same notion as uniting all humanity. And so in a way, even though he may have come upon it later, than his uh, adventures at the UN in declaring and world citizenship ideas. But I think it probably gave a real deep structure and meaning once he got to grasp the meaning of Vedanta, of the unity of one and oneness and breakup of division and walls and all of these sort of when you get into the spiritual knowledge of Vedanta, you recognize that sense of uh, uh, universality of all and everything of which we are all part of and, and breakdown of all distinctions and so on and so forth. Anyway, yeah. just a thought I had. Yeah, I agree. You're right, Bharat. It definitely reinforced his idea that you know world citizenship and world federation were the way the, the path to the roadmap or the path to to world peace uh, that that's the way we had to understand how how we're how we are already one definitely thank you for for sharing that uh, Barbara I guess what, since you haven't talked yet we, we'll take your comment and then I'm going to go on to Bob I know Bob I'm waiting for Bob too um, Robert Mueller my husband always said that until we have this division until we get rid of the division between nation states and we get back to being one world, we're not gonna have peace. And every time I hear about Gary Davis, I realize they were synonymous. They were both like Gary Davis and Robert Mueller. And I wanted to make one comment to Bob. Bob, I also have piles and bookcases of Robert's materials. And there is a way to do this and it's called the Visioneers in, Cal in Canada. And they're starting to archive these great thinkers and put it together thevisioneers.ca. But when you get to the point where you can find a way that we can have these brilliant people and their ideas and their evolution, because they are evolutionary beings. They didn't get born like this. Their experiences brought them to this. And I just think that we're also lucky when you find those coincidences. And that's what Gary lived on was his coincidences. When something happened, he took the action. And this morning I was reading something. It's not about action or no action. It's about the freedom to keep yourself free. The long as you can keep yourself free. And that's what I admired about Gary. He kept himself free, even though he was moving. Thank you. Yeah. And, and Barbara, I really appreciate your, your participation in the documentary. And I love how you talk about how you and Robert had visited the bridge at Kell, you know, where Gary had his post. That's uh, just, it sends tingles up my spine hearing about that. It was quite a moment when we were sitting there and Robert remembered Gary so well. I think Gary was his best friend because they think that they thought so much alike. It was yeah. a time. It's almost like when the airplane was invented, how many other people invented the airplane? Who, you know, this global citizenship, how many other people were doing that? That's why I love the World Federation. 
Yeah, no, definitely. And we have to put people in positions like Robert was in as Undersecretary General of the UN, position, people in positions of power who also support World Federation. This is, a, this is a, a, a important part that will bring us to now, I think the next portion of our discussion is, is the symbolic actions and where those symbolic actions can lead actually potentially to political power. So now I'd like to hand it over to Bob for, for a few minutes to talk about that. Yeah, yeah, th thank you, David. And thank you for your excellent work, work in, this, in this two session so far. Nice. Um, so yeah, so, so that all leads us to the obvious question, what can we do? And, and are there any lessons that, that we've learned from Gary's life and his work that we can apply to our own? So some of you may have been in previous meetings where you heard me rave about this book. It's called This is an Uprising. And it's, in, in my opinion, it, it's the uh, most outstanding book on social movement building that I've read. Uh, and I taught a course in social movement building. So <laughs> I, 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 I can't rave about that book enough. And what the authors do, they're two brothers. So their mother must have done something right. Um, Engler and Engler. Um, what, they, what they do is they take all of this social movement building activity and they put it in two categories. They say there's some activities that what they, they call instrumental. It's the organization building, the infrastructure, um, you know, doing, you know, the, 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 you know, talking to your neighbor, you know, doing kind of incremental, slow, gradual things. And then there is in the, the second category is what they, they call the symbolic actions, like Gandhi's salt march, you know, the Montgomery bus boycott, the Edmund Pettus Bridge, you know, going over that, the things that, that you know, light up the world, get worldwide attention. And they, they, the, the, the brothers in this book make the point that if you look at what happened right after the salt march, right after the Montgomery bus boycotts, even in Montgomery, they go into some detail and say that, you know, th that there were laws changed, but then they changed them back, you know? And, and, and a lot of those symbolic actions may not actually gain a lot of ground, but they plant the seed, you know, the, the, they alert the world to something that then takes a life of its own. Uh, Martin Luther King used the same distinction. He didn't use the same words, uh, but for, the, for, for what the Eng Engel brothers called symbolic actions, he said, uh, Martin Luther King talked about actions that dramatize injustice you know, that dramatize inequality, you know. So he said that you have to do these dramatic actions. And interestingly, again, this is something I didn't know and learned in that book, that people who proponents of both of those different, different kinds of actions often fight each other. They each one goes, you know, no, no, that's not the right thing. We got to do this, we got to do that. Um, I forgot who, um, oh, I'm right now, the, the fellow who was Hillary Clinton's mentor, um, the, the labor movement guy and, uh, and ringing any bells. Um, oh, geez, do I have his book here? Um, I don't have it. Oh, geez. Um, he wrote the guide to radicals or whatever. I'm blanking on his name right now. That very well-known movement building guy. And, and he was trying to build labor unions and stuff like that. And he severely criticized Martin Luther King and guy, he said, that's worthless, that stuff. You know, you got to build institutions, build, you know, you got to build power through labor movements and stuff like that, kind of the incremental stuff. So where I stand now and, and what often, you know, when all of these movements mature, people realize, hey, you need both, you know. So as far as I'm concerned, now this is me talking, not a, not a book, is that the World Federalist Movement as a whole has been very heavy on the instrumental work, the, the, the slow, steady, incremental stuff. Really, we've done very little in the symbolic. I think that's because the incrementalists are very often academics, you know, and academics are scared, you know, by, they don't want to lose their university position or whatever. So it's natural. I'm not criticizing, but I think we've leaned heavy on the in incremental side, the, the instrumental side. And the question is, is there anything we could learn on the other side, these larger symbolic actions? You know, Gary certainly demonstrated them time and time again. Um, a number of young people in the movement uh, have tried this. Some of you are familiar with the Global Week of Action for World Parliament and have people around the world hold up signs, World Parliament Now, during one week every year. 
So there have been some meager attempts, but what is it, you know, can we do something that will further the movement that's dramatic, symbolic, et cetera, et cetera. So I wanted to kind of give that framing and background, then I'll turn it over to David again and, uh, and invite all of you uh, to get the uh, creative juices going and look at, you know, what, what can we do, if anything? And probably there are many things uh, in that more dramatic, symbolic side. So take it back, David. Yeah, so um, just to really follow what Bob said, um, I had come up with five questions that link, you know, Gary's work to and World Federation and World Citizenship. Uh, but I think the most important for all of our work really is was my question where I said, um, you know, what can we learn and take away from the story to advance the movement now? And what bold actions uh, similar to what Gary did can we take those two in particular? So why don't we start with those two? Does, does anyone, you yeah. know, I mean, and I'm sorry, I'm going to, I'm going to just going to cut it again. Sure. Everyone may not have their chat box open, but da David, um, uh, David put the name of that person I was struggling for, Saul Alinsky. Uh, he's the one I was trying to remember. Thank you. Sorry about that, David. Go ahead. Oh, no, no worries. No, that's great. So, uh, well, Arthur, you're, you're first in the queue. Yeah. Uh, if you have some ideas about bold actions that we might take now, and then everybody else could start putting your thinking caps on so we can because this, I think, actually for, right. for our discussion, Ron, this yeah. is this, and for moving forward, this is probably the most important discussion we're going to have. Okay, right. go, go ahead, Arthur. Well, I think the key is right here on page 148. We talk grandly about democracy and freedom, saying it's our way of life. Then when it comes down come to independent thinking and action, we lie down like beaten dogs and whine that we aren't the government, therefore it isn't our fault that the bombs fall. What colossal nonsense. We are the government, each one of us, and now we've had two world wars to prove our lack of moral guts to claim it. Do we have to wait for World War III before we wake up to the realization that after all, we had the power and, and intelligence to prevent it if we had acted on time? And I think the key thing that Gary said, he said it to me, he said it right in that top secret. We don't have to beg our government leaders, plague and plead them to make peace. Look at how much effort we put into lobbying, begging, begging uh, all over the world, petitions, elections, all this. When we, the people, it says right in the Declaration of Independence, we, the people, institute new government. It's in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and all those things. Gary says, why don't we, the people, just get together and do it, for God's sake. Forget about them. Forget about protesting them. It's like, Mar it's like what Bucky Fuller said. You never, like Einstein said, you never solve things at the problem in which, at the level at which it was created. You have to go to a whole new level. And like Buckminster Fuller said, don't fight the old order, just create something new. Gary says, we just get together. We have incredible new tools with the internet. He was so excited by those, his synergistic ideas, his ways of bringing people together and not taking the same old model of, of win-lose democracy and majority rule and trying to put that up and getting people to federate and all that because you know, you're still stuck in the old system. We have incredible tools. We just get together. We create a new interactive system that that instead of win-lose is what Barbara does, you know, revolutionary conversations, get people together. You put people in these Zoom talks, you get them together, they synergize, they come up with the best ideas, those synergize with others, and those come together and synergize the planet. And we, when once we people start doing that, all the others, they're gonna jump to follow us. They're, you know, I'm their leader, I must follow them, there go my people, as Gandhi said. We the people have to get together and do it, and that's why we have these people planet Powered Planet podcast each week to talk about how do we get together and just do it. You know, it's like Nike, Nike said, just do it. Well, so Arthur, really quickly, I want something specific because what you said is almost like a promotion for the for the film. I don't mean to be rude, but but so what I'm saying is, there something specific though that you've come out from your People Powered podcast or something with the people you've spoken with, other than what Gary's already done, other with other than like people identifying themselves as a world citizen or whatever. Well, specifically, let me cut again. We've got about 20 minutes for this part of the conversation. All right. Make it just real quickly, we need to create an interactive website that we need to get some funding to do it that actually does that, brings people into it. We need a major ongoing Netflix series that gets everybody joining it. And we need to actually just start start doing it. We create the app. It's right in the, in, in the Gary show. We had it in the, in the film, the cap, you know, here's the we go. We're all starting to do it. I have some papers about how to do it. And if people want to know, we'll, we'll talk about it. <laughs> okay, great. That's perfect. That's what I was looking for. Okay, Ron, um, you were next. I want, I just want to note 
that there, in my view, there are three things that keep people separated from each other. The first one is religion. And it is nice that we've talked about the religion of India, but we don't want to forget about Judaism and the influence of the Jewish religion. It's very important to me to know that his father was Jewish. That's not a minor thing for me. The Jews were the first ones in the West to emphasize morality as part of religion. Before that, religion was mainly a matter of rituals and the Jews were the ones that made morality fundamental. The second thing is language. Right now, it's obvious we're coming into a world where English is the dominant language and languages do separate people, but if you don't have a common language, you can't communicate with other people. And it is important to realize right now, we've got a lot of English speaking people that are focused on our ideas, but they're also limited to English. And I think it's a real important thing to realize the importance of Esperanto. Zamenhof, the creator of, of Esperanto was Jewish. I mean, he had the idea of universality as a Jew. In fact, he wrote a book called Me Estes Homo. I'm a human being. I'm not just a Jew. And then the third thing, of course, is what we world federalists have always emphasized is government, and especially national governments that keep us separated from each other. The United Nations is a beautiful example of an effort to overcome that, but it has not succeeded yet because of nationalism. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, Gary would always talk about how at the city level, governments are on the same uh, horizontal power level. In fact, there's, you know, uh, what do they call it? conferences of, of uh, mayors of cities of the world, and they come together and they can work together. They have in, same infrastructure, same issues. It's just when you get to that higher level where the there's a disparity between power, and that's what causes the you know the anarchy and the and the violence. Yes. Um, other, other oh, Barat, you were next. Okay. <clears throat> well, uh, I sort of, you know. Thinking about this, I'm thinking about how structures come together, the physical forms of structures building. Usually the coalescence that occurs, that fluid matter solidifies, generally happens as local action. So you have locally uh, structures building from you know, nebulous forms floating around, they come together like stars get formed in the universe. And you have a collections of stars. Galaxies only come together after you've had enough stars. And so my thinking is that Gary's model of world citizenship might be a good way to develop a kind of centers, uh, world citizenship centers in different parts of the world, even in United States. Let's just not keep it in Washington. We'll set one up in St. Paul, Minnesota. You know, we'll do it in uh, other cities with like, and so have local communities feel a sense of buy-in to this idea that we are all world citizens. I mean, we may be Americans, we may be Minnesotans, we may be, but we are also world citizens. And then by having that identity, you know, it's a ritual, but it's a very important ritual. And then the kinds of things that Arthur is saying make sense because, you know, this idea of being in the world electronically really doesn't change the behavior of local communities at all. You know, and so, but on the other hand, if local communities are involved in such global thinking, and once you have the center where people can sign in and become world citizens, maybe we can have Ron Glossop's idea of one language where we could bring in the sense of uh, having world citizens, you know, become uh, Esperantos. And we provide them, 
you know, local opportunity for doing that. So in a way, this is kind of on one hand incremental as, you know, going back to Bob's description of the uprising, but it also is kind of unique. It's sort of symbolic. And, and so a lot of these small, small symbolic steps around may develop a critical mass. And then we can make this appeal uh, that would be much more effective because it'll come from the ground up rather than being you know, pushed from up above. Anyway, that's, that's the kind of uh, uh, thought process. Okay, so I've seen uh, Ron, Donna, and Barbara's hands uh, up. So I guess Ron, yours was the first, yes. but oh, really- We have about 10 minutes for this uh, segment. Uh, okay, just I was just gonna simply say one thing that as you were talking about that came to mind is that potentially each of the chapters of Citizens for Global Solutions could also be considered maybe a world citizen center where people could uh, declare a world, you know, declare the, the, the region or the city or the, the club, the, the, chapter, a world citizen chapter, just like cities have mundialized and declared their, their world status. So that's something we could be, potentially do through CGS. Uh, I love that idea. Anyway, go ahead, Ron. Well, I met, I'm glad you just mentioned mundialization because that's what I wanted to talk about. Many people don't know that many cities, including St. Louis, have already declared that they are world cities. And uh, at one point, and there were several cities in France, and they would fly the UN flag. And then it was one of our own World Federalist leaders that suggested that maybe we should do that on college campuses. And in fact, that's exactly what I did where I was teaching at Southern Illinois University in Edwardsville. And that UN flag that went up in 1974 is still flying there on campus along with the national flag and the state flag. And that's a way of getting people to... Now, the other side of it is the flag is still there, but the kids are not paying any attention to it anymore because there's nobody on campus anymore that was doing what I was doing. Thank you, Ron. Okay, Donna, you're next and then Barbara. Yeah, so, I mean, I think that would be awesome to re-energize that mondialization uh, so cities could declare themselves. But I think we have to take the lesson from Gary that if we don't do it with a lot of publicity, it's not, it, you know, we need to do it with more publicity so that it's better seen. Um, I, um, the other thing I want to share, an idea from a woman named Vernita Pearl Fort, who, um, who is um, a member of the Democratic World Federalist, and she's working on a degree in um, music. A, music, Bob, do you remember the name of it? Music, music and, as a human right. Use, music as a human right. Yeah. That's and I had this very exciting talk with her about her idea is that, like on a local level, to organize um, people coming together to sing you know, and, and not, so not like what the global citizen concerts are, where you listen to other people sing, but this is actually engaging people. And, and anyway, so that, that might be, and that might tie in with this idea of, of cities declaring themselves, you know, citizen, world citizen cities. Um, so anyway, I just wanted to share that idea. Um, Barbara, and then Bob, and then Ron. Well, there's so many great ideas, but you know, uh, there's so many things that are already going on, like the United Nations Associations. I'm president of the United Nations Association on purpose so that I can do the local to the global because I totally agree with everything that's been mm -hmm. said. If you can't do it on the local level, then you can have, the, when you do it on the local level, it causes people to pay attention. We just, as our United Nations Association gave Ambassador Chadre Robert Mueller Peace Prize, and the first one we gave to Ted Turner. Why? Because it created media attention. And I think the World Federalists have to look at who is doing what we're trying to espouse that we all do and honor them. Why? Edward Bernays, the founder of PR, said you engineer the consent of the public you are counting on. One, awareness, information, persuasion, reassurance. If somebody is doing something right, reassure them with the prize. Why do we give the Nobel Peace Prize? So other people have that model. Why do I do peacepodcast.org and get any luminary I can find on so that other have models? 
those models are there. So there's so much out there. We don't have, we have to share our resources. My Peace Podcast, I'm president of the Rotary E-Club of World Peace. Why? Attention, attention, attention. Awareness, information, persuasion to do something. And when they do it, honor them, reassure them, and then evaluate and start over. It takes seven times to go from awareness to persuasion. One time doesn't work. Look how many times Robert Mueller wrote ideas. Now we have goodmorningworld.org. Every day we give one of his 7,500 ideas. Every day. You have to have the enthusiasm when you're out there. Um, why was I attracted to Robert? Why was he attracted to me? Enthusiasm. We were both so enthusiastic about peace that we were like a magnet. And go where those people are shouting your values. Let those values be known. And so you don't have to support everybody who doesn't agree with you. But if you do, use the stop sign. Stop and pay attention because maybe they have something you need to hear rather than trying to convince them. So I could go on all day because this is my business. I was trained by Edward Bernays and he's the one who ended World War II with words. And I was lucky enough to marry Robert. And I want to thank all of you who were on for this. Keeping the faith of Gary Davis, keeping the World Federalists alive, keeping the United Nations on its 75th anniversary. We are so wonderful. And we just have to honor ourselves for doing the work. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. That's excellent. Um, Bob, you're next. OK. Um, yeah, well, I, I just want to throw an idea into the soup that scares me. So it's probably good. Uh, but anyway. <laughs> Um, that, that I imagine in the future, when we're a little bit bigger, um, that we have a conference um, that, you know, post COVID, so we're all going to fly to someplace. And we get about, you know, three or four or five cities that have coordinated this, where in each city we have about 50 people that show up at the airport ready to fly with the world passport only. And we, uh, we contact the media nationally. So we let the press, we issue press releases. So basically we have several hundred people going to major airports around the world with the world passport. You know, nice people asking to board the plane for a conference um, and see what happens. And um, so that's, uh, that's my idea. Thank you. And we've got about five minutes for this portion. Thank you. Okay, Ron, you had, thanks Bob. I just Ron, you wanted to make a mention here of the idea of music but when you start singing, you got a new kind of problem. And in the European Union, they've got this European anthem, Ode to Joy, but the people can't sing it together because they each use their own national language. <laughs> so it just shows again how language is so important. And the same, with, even with writing music, there are different systems of writing music in different parts of the world but they've come together and they can read each other, but they don't have a common one. So common language is absolutely critical, especially if you're gonna get personal contacts. I see it happen with the Esperantists. The Esperantists re readily get themselves feeling, we are a community, but it's because they have a common language. Okay, thanks Ron. Um, other final comments? Go ahead, Barbara. Robert always opened the hearts of his audiences by playing the 10 whole harmonica Ode to Joy. Do, 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 do. And that's on peacepodcast.org. No language had to be spoken. He would just stand up and play that harmonica. And hundreds of people, hearts would open and they could hear what he had to say. So I want to add music as an introduction to a meeting, introduction to something that you want the people to have their hearts open. Okay. And it's on peacepodcast.org. That's my website if you want to look at watch Robert play the harmonica. And you're welcome to put that in the chat box if you want to as well. All right, thanks. Yeah, I did uh, about a month ago a group called Square Meter for Peace, which is out of Winnipeg, Canada, and World Service Authority with the help of, of the uh, Rotary in Winnipeg sponsored a Healing the World Through Music event. But it was uh, geared so that we had about five different uh, musical acts and they, they were the ones who sang. But I love this idea of not, you know, getting singers to sit who are singers to sing, but to get us the people to sing, or even if it's to hum, if, because we don't know the same 
language. And uh, so one, but one thing that came to me uh, last night when I was thinking about, well, what bold action can we take or what, what can, how can we get into the minds and hearts of the, of the world? And that is uh, maybe we need to start um, encouraging people, especially young people to uh, become world candidates. Um, and, and that me on a world citizen or a world federation party platform, maybe we need to make, if we have, we probably, I know we, I know at WSA, we have a world citizen party platform. I have a whole file cabinet of information on that. I assume that maybe there's a world federation party platform, but we could bring these together and actually start fielding individuals who could, uh, whether it's to join a city council or to become a mayor or, uh, to, you know, actually run for uh, state Senate or, or even the, the national Senate, not just here, but in other parts of the world, uh, you know, if we can, you know, do the bold actions, but also weave people into the, the fabric of society who are in positions of power, we could really make a change. I don't, how do we do that? I have no idea, <laughs> but, but I'd love to see that as a, as a one, one, roadmap towards this goal. Other final thoughts before we, because we only have about one minute left. And the other final thoughts uh, uh, on, on bold actions, we could take up this idea about bold actions that we could take. And I'd actually like you to think about it uh, over the next month before we, and as you watch the film uh, again, uh, so we can come back to the last meeting, not only just telling anecdotes and sharing stories of how we knew Gary and the actions that he's taken. And I'll talk about other bold actions that Gary took uh, when I tell those the stories and anecdotes next next session, but anyway, uh, any other final comment in the, in the last thirty seconds? Great. Okay, well, I'll, I'll make one, which is thank you very very much, David, for all your preparation and fine facilitation of this. Um, and and to bring us to close, I want to say in the final fifteen minutes, I want to give Arthur half of that time uh, to talk about the fi his film. Uh, and how the group who, if you haven't seen it before, I will tell you it's a must see. I, I've seen it, I don't know, two dozen times and I, I get something new and get re-energized still to this day. So it, it's, and if you've seen it already, you may be like me and want to see it again. So if Arthur, you would take a, a, up to seven and a half minutes roughly uh, to talk about that. And then I'll talk about the next book and uh, put in a plug for our upcoming convention. So take it away, Excellent. Arthur. All right. Well, first of all, thank you, everybody. This is so inspiring. And uh, Barbara, is, I'm so glad she's joined us because she is so inspiring. And I put the Rotary E-Club of World Peace uh, uh, meeting website in there. So you can join that every Tuesday at, uh, uh, at uh, 6.30 PM Pacific time. Uh, you're welcome to join with wonderful speakers that she, she helped pull together. Um, but basically, on Gary's film, okay, the amazing new thing. I think, I, is there anybody on this call who has not seen the film at least once? If you, if you haven't seen the no. film, raise your hand. Okay, so if you've not seen the movie, nobody has not seen it. So what I'm going to do is encourage you to do what Bob said, actually see it again. It is kind of incredible that you get something new out of it each time. I've shown people the film. And they said, oh, I love all those new scenes you put in and stuff. And, and we didn't have anything. They just think there's new stuff because, you know, there's so much in it, you, you, you forget it. it. Going back to Gary's book, it's been the same thing. That, I mean, I so enjoyed rereading it. Like, wow, all this great new stuff. <laughs> anyway, so that's very worthwhile. Uh, but the big, big thing that's happening now is that uh, NETA is sending the film, has already sent the program offer out to all the uh, public broadcasting stations in the country. And what we're doing is using this as an opportunity to raise some key funds to really start publicizing this. So it's not just a small group of people who've seen this, but it really is starting to get out to the world. And so what's happening is uh, uh, we have still slightly other, another version, just uh, slightly abbreviated to fit their format. Uh, and Melanie has been so key in, in creating this. We've got these new wonderful spots with uh, Martin Sheen, uh, we, even in the middle of COVID, we had his, his daughter and his wife filming him in his uh, garden, making these 30 second spots. And uh, the first time they did them, they held the camera vertical. We said, no, no, it's coming. So we had to do them over. But we got some great spots out of it that uh, you'll, you'll see. We can, uh, I think we can forward them out uh, if you want to see those. But the key thing is we'd love to have people join in being uh, sponsors on this, on the, call, on the uh, film. Uh, for only $1,000, uh, you can be listed at the opening of the film. It says, this program is brought to you by, and it has key places that have brought, brought us, uh, you know, that's presented by key people. 
and individuals, companies, organizations, as long as they comply with the with the guidelines that PBS points puts out. But I'd love if you would Thank talk you. to me Arthur? further. So our, the 1,000 would be your name would be up, and then you can actually, for 5,000, have your name read beautifully by Jordan. He's a voiceover expert, and also have a logo or your website. So that's yeah, they, yeah, yeah. 1,000 is just the name listed, and 5,000 they can get. Uh, right, just like you said. Uh, yeah, and 25,000, 15 seconds. You can do, but you have to do the guidelines. But it is kind well, of that like would be that would probably be for like if anyone has a company they know of that we could contact. Yeah. Uh, they, you see those on on public broadcasting, and and so we would so welcome people to help us do this. Maybe some of you want to get together. And combine it, uh, but they have to act really fast because they actually, uh, they actually want the the the, the email this the, the new version of the film this Monday, and we're doing final trims on it. So if any of you can join us in actually being listed as a sponsor at the opening of the film, you need to let us know right away. Uh, can maybe let's just have a little discussion about that. If there's anyone, well, well Arthur, what I'd like you, you Arthur, what I would like you to do so people know is how to access the film. Uh, but the, between now and our next session, if people want to see it again or show other people or whatever, please speak right. to that. We've, well, got so about we two go, more min- we've got two more minutes. Thank you. Okay. So if we go to theworldismycountry.com, uh, you'll see the link you can click on to, to get to watch uh, a version of it free. It, it's part of, it's packaged in the We Are One with the little short films and the long one. Uh, and, uh, but I do want to take the last, last part of the two minutes just to see, are there any takers for becoming sponsors and having your names read on the air at the beginning of the show? Nobody raising their hand? I guess, uh, if, anyway, if you, if you can, if anybody can get together with that or you know somebody who can, does anyone know someone we can contact or call today who might be a sponsor to getting this film on yeah. PBS? If I could ask people to email you, uh, what is your e- Could you put your email okay, address? My email is just my name, Arthur. It's right on my name on the oh, screen, great. Arthur Canagus at gmail.com. I can repeat that in the chat, but it's also there right under my name. Yeah, it's right there uh, with your name. Yeah. Right. And uh, so, yeah, email me if you have any ideas, somebody who could help, uh, could do that, who can afford to uh, put in some funds to get this started. Uh, it would be so valuable because we need those resources to make sure, even though, okay, the other thing you can do that's absolutely free is you can call your local station manager and you can say, uh, I understand NETA, NETA, Melanie can write that in the chat, is sending out uh, the, that has sent the film, you the offer to show the film, The World is My Country. When is it going to be scheduled in our area? I want to let our groups and organizations know. If you present it that way, it's not like you're lobbying. Oh, please run this show. It's like, oh, we need to know when you're scheduling it because we have so many people who want to watch it. I want to get the word out. Uh, then that's sort of attracting them rather than pushing them. So I think that's the way to, to ask. And if any of you can, just, just call your local station, ask if you can talk to the station manager. Uh, Dick Bernard, actually, this was before COVID, but took a letter down physically and put it, put it in, their, in their hands. Uh, but do what you can to get to the station manager to, uh, to uh, find out when they can show it in your area. Uh, and and it's, all they need is the name of the film and knowing it was sent to them by NETA. There are three actually providers of programming, two public broadcasting, two, there's a lot of them, uh, ITVS, but there's three major ones and NETA is one of the top providers of all the programming that they have ready to go in their satellite field. They just push a button and it comes into their, into their uh, program schedule. Okay, well, thank you so much, Arthur, and, and especially thank you for creating the film. I understand that it was something like 17 years in the making. Uh, yeah. So I, I, I just want everybody to know the real you know, act of love that this was and the, the blood, sweat, and tears uh, that Arthur put into making it. So well, indeed, uh, that, that's absolutely right. It was blood, sweat, and tears. Uh, and, you know, yeah, uh, no, 2000 is when uh, I like to get the story. To but I want to shout out to Melanie, who, if, if, <laughs> oh, yeah. if it not for her, we couldn't have done this film. She is absolutely key. So thank you, Melanie. Great, terrific. Yes, take a bow. Well, thank you both. A- a- absolutely. So, um, so let me uh, give the, the the last two announcements that I mentioned at the beginning. Is usually at the session before the last session of a big, you know particular book we begin to talk about what the next book will be. And if you were with us for a while, you remember that we actually picked two books 
Um, so we, and that seemed to work very well. So we didn't have to spend all the time, you know, each one, we, we got two done at once. So most of the books that we've talked about, or if you just think about the books of World Federation in general, um, that they tend to fall into two different categories. There are books that are kind of broad overviews of the whole area, like the Juncker book that we did, uh, The Idea of World Government. And then there, or, or, or Ron's book, which, we, which was the last one we did, looking at the overall arguments for it, against it, the rebuttals to those, so kind of the big picture books. And then there are books that were, and most of those are, are, are historical, that promote a specific path or a specific kind of World Federation. Um, so then there were, were a variety of these books so that, that are pr promoting a particular model of what a World Federation can look like. So, um, so that's another kind of book and we have not looked at those. I'm not saying we should, but you know, we, we have not looked at those yet. So what we're going to do is send around a couple of what seem to be the most popular books in each category. So you can see some of the ones we have not yet read. I, like I'm thinking, for example, Mortimer Adler's book, How to Think of War, or I think that's the, the title or something like that. That'd be a good general book. And then there are books, um, oh God, I'm forgetting the name, blanking again on the name. Um, but there are, there are two or three books on specific models of World Federation. So, um, so we'll, we'll send those names out. And if you have others that you know about that you think are really exciting, by all means, respond to that email and throw your book in the soup as well. Not literally in the soup, but you know what I mean. Throw it into the conversation. So then at the next meeting, uh, we could pick hopefully the next two books and then be off and running. So that's, that's how we'll, we'll proceed with that. The last thing I want to say is in, invite you all. Uh, CGS has an annual national convention. Um, we've been doing it for years. Last one was in LA. Um, Tom Hastings was one of the hosts who's on the call. Um, and, um, and this will be the first one that we're doing on Zoom. Uh, so you don't have to pay a plane ticket. You don't have to, um, you know, buy, you know, rent, a, get a hotel room, et cetera, et cetera. You could just tune in. So if you have not yet gotten, we already put it out on our newsletter and a few other ways. But if you have not gotten that, you can go to our website, globalsolutions.org. And on the homepage, if you scroll down to the bottom, uh, the, the event will be there. If you click on that, it will take you into the full page with the description, the program, et cetera, et cetera. And with the instruction, there's a link on how to register. Um, there are three, it's a three day conference, the 18th, 19th and 20th. We made the day short because in our experience, full day Zoom calls are grueling and people's eyes begin to cross. Uh, so each day is about three hours. So they're relatively short. We pushed it more toward the end of the day uh, so that the students who are in, you know, on Zoom classes or folks who are working can participate. So we wanted to accommodate them. And the, the whole program is there. So you could see that. You would need the way the software is set up, just to let you know, um, you need to register for each day separately. So when you fill it out for, for you know, day one, if you wanna to go to all of them, then a screen will pop up with the same form you just filled out. It's very short, but it'll be blank, okay? And you'll go, what did I do wrong? No, you didn't do anything wrong. It's the second day, look on top, it'll say day two. So then you fill out day two and then day three will pop up. So just to know that when I first saw that, I said, what, what happened? It didn't take my application? No, it did. It, each day it does separately. We're using new software, we're learning it too. So, um, so with that, I want to thank you all for joining us. Again, I want to thank, um, oh, I see a question from Ron. I just want to make a comment with Please. regard to books. Don't forget the book reviews on our website. Oh, yes, thank you. That's right. You, you can both read the reviews and also get clued in to other books that you may want to refer to the book club. Thank you. Did I see another hand? Yes, Tom Hastings. you got to take yourself off mute. And... Let us see something a little more than your forehead once you've yes. done that. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> um, do you think people would want to come to just one or two or three or they yes. need to come? Yes, people are invited. I mean, the beauty of Zoom is you can just come for an hour. You know, yes. you could just come for a session. But if you only come for one of the days, you have to register for the full day, 
and then you can just come into the presentations you want. Uh, we will have people from other World Federalist organizations presenting. We always do that. We have a, um, a panel on youth and, and the, the, the kind of the, the, well, we have a youth panel on creating a youth movement. We have another panel on World Federation and the environment um, and, and a number of interesting things we have not looked at before. So programs it, all on online. Okay. Arthur? It is still possible to add a program about uh, how we actually create this. Uh, the, the program uh, was closed and printed out weeks ago. Okay. There's no, there's no room next to time, add a program. Next time, let's, let's do a program on exactly the question that was asked here. How do we actually go okay. ahead and yeah. do it? Yeah, I'll, I'll say this at the, um, at, the, at the seminar, but the way we are at the, at, the, at the convention, but we sent out a survey to our board uh, and a few other high participating volunteers to get uh, input for it. And then a committee looked at, you know, created the program out of that input. So it, okay. it, it wasn't out of the mind of just one person and uh, all of these things, you know, competing interest and time and all that stuff. So we did our best to meet all the needs yeah. that were I identified to us. Thing, Bob, how lucky we are we have Zoom. I am yeah. all over the world, all of the time. I have people in Australia who are my best friends and between Zoom and our books, the making of a peacemaker. I'll send the prophet, the hat maker son to anybody that wants it for free. This is how you become a peacemaker. Our grandchildren have to read these books. My grandchildren surprised the heck out of me because they were, we played the harmonica to them when my daughter was pregnant. And when they got out of the womb, they were ready for the harmonica. We have to really get our kids from the day they're conceived to the day they die to be peacemakers, right? Right. right. Yeah. Well, and I thank you because I think the mention of Zoom is the perfect segue to let everybody Zoom back to the rest of their lives. Uh, I will invite uh, David Gallup to stay on to debrief this. Uh, Donna, if you want to, you can as well. And with that, I'll see, we'll see you next month. Um, it's the uh, second, was the second Saturday of the month, right? December 12th. <clears throat> okay, yes, December 12th. Okay, have a great oh, month. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Bless your hearts. Thank you. So stop, stop Thanks for coming, Barbara. It was great meeting you, oh, Barbara. Stop the recording. Yes, thank you. Great meeting. Thank you. Thanks.